Good morning and welcome to Northwest Fencing Center. This is Coach Michael McTeague and today our Wednesday Armory session is going to be all about what's in a weapon and how you set up a blade. We're only going to be able to scratch so much of this particular itch on this video, but I'm going to try and answer a lot of questions I've been getting a lot of lately and uh, also, <clears throat> excuse me, and also give you guys some, some tips about how to set a blade up and some of the rules and stuff that surround that. Later on in subsequent videos, we'll do some deep dives into some places where I've had some real questions like types of French grips for FA and that kind of thing. But today, let's start off with a few basics before we move along. And we're gonna start with the basics and rules that apply to all weapons. Uh, or both the weapons we're talking about, foil and epee. And then we're also going to move into um, the epee blade, foil specific rules and set up. And then we'll move into epee rules and set up because much of the stuff from foil is applicable to the epee. So as we move along, um, uh, when we get into the epee stuff, you foil fencers, you can tune right out if you want to. Um, but epee fencers, you want to kind of pay attention because some of the stuff we'll cover now will come up a little bit later in the video as well. Now, I've got a practice blade here and we're going to just kind of define first what the heck we're talking about with all this stuff. First of all, we have the tip of the weapon, all right? If it's an electric blade, that tip, the word tip includes the little push button piece, uh, that's the tip, and the point is the barrel and all the pieces together is screwed onto the end. So we have our point at the tip of the blade then we have the tang. This is the part of the blade that you can see. It's threaded over this length. And this is an uncut tang, which is what you'd use to set up a French grip. And with a practice weapon, the next thing that would go on would be your go up guard, a pad of some type, usually felt. Then you'd have your grip, in this case, a French grip, but it could just as easily be a pistol grip. And then we have the pommel nut, which goes on the end of that. In the case of a French grip, the pommel is pretty obvious. It's that big metal piece out on the end. In the case of a pistol grip, it's a small nut that slides inside the pistol grip. And now we have a weapon all assembled. Again, the pommel or pommel nut, the grip, the pad, the bell guard, the blade itself, uh, the tip and barrel up here. And if we have an electric weapon, we'll have the socket. Now, if we take a look at um, some general rules for all weapons. First off, general rule for all weapons, um, or for, for foils and FAs, all the weapons at this club, is length. And if you are a Y10 fencer, in other words, if you're 10 or younger, you will be fencing with what's called a number two blade. Blades come in four sizes, but three only three of them are really common. There's a size zero, but you hardly ever see them anymore. They're little tangy short blades. But size two is the shortest, lightest blade that's commonly available. <clears throat> and it's mandatory for fencers uh, in the Y10 field to be fencing with a number two blade. This just keeps the playing field even, but obviously they're also smaller, lighter, easier for those smaller and lighter fencers to wield. Next most common is gonna be a size four. It's longer than a size two. Um, and this is often used as a blade of transition for smaller, lighter fencers. Maybe they're in the Y12 or Y14 category, but they're still very small people and they need a lighter, quicker blade. Um, some veteran fencers might use a four specifically because it is a lighter, quicker blade, particularly in foil where there's a lot of, in, might be a lot more infighting. And then lastly, there's the number five blade. And this is what we call a standard blade. This is your most common blade size. Once you've passed the age of 10, you can use one. Um, defer to your coach as to whether they think you should move immediately to um, a number five blade or hold off and wait until... Um, you're a little bit bigger and stronger. Now, um, 
general rules for all weapons as well as the length of the grip. Uh, this really only comes up in a French grip, but there are a gauge they have. It can be no longer than 200 millimeters from in front of the bell guard to the back of the blade. And you can see that this is a standard setup with no cant in the blade and it is maximum length. And that's true for both foil and epi. Now, <clears throat> excuse me. Let's talk a little bit about grips for a moment. And this is again true for both sets of weapons. Grips break down into two major categories, traditional French grip and an orthopedic grip, or many people just simply call it pistol grip, this kind of a catch-all. The pistol grips also break down into a whole bunch of categories. There's a slew of pistol grips available. Um, but the two most common that you'll find are a Belgian grip, and a pistol grip, which is called a Visconti. First question I get from new fencers is, how do I hold one? Well, with a French grip, we've been told, taught to hold it with our fingers and our other fingers wrapping around to hold it, the pommel against our, our wrist, and our fingers pinching up here so that we manipulate the blade with our fingers. It's no different with either of these grips. My first two fingers, my thumb and forefinger are pinching, but now my helper fingers have more to wrap around and I'm still keeping the back of the weapon against my wrist. On a Belgian grip, simply two fingers go in front of the first and then two fingers on the second. Which one should you use? one you're most comfortable with and you may need to experiment a little bit with club weapons or borrowing a friend's weapon or your coach may have a suggestion for you as to what they think will work best for your style level of strength um, and and how they see your game developing they may decide that particular grip is going to be more appropriate than another one now, French grips go break into a whole bunch of uh, different types as well, but we're going to cover that uh, a little bit later on. Matter of fact, that'll be the last thing we cover in this video for you um, FA fencers that are curious about that. You'll find in foil, it's typical to start people off with a French grip that builds finger strength and a very nice blade feel or sentiment de faire for you French speakers out there. But all high level foil fencers, you look at the World Cup, the national level, everybody that's up there on the top of the points list is using some kind of orthopedic grip. So foil fencers will make that transition from learning with a French grip to a pistol grip. Now, how do we set up a grip and, um, and set up a blade? Now, the grip come in various sizes and they're they come right out of the blade. We call it a stock grip. It's just a stock length and whatnot. Now, you may wind up taking a grip and cutting it down. You may find that this size feels good in your hand, but there's a lot of grip sticking in front of your thumb. Um, and you want to get this cut back so that the tip of the grip, the, the grip, the, your thumb basically is against the bell guard. How firmly against the bell guard is going to be um, somewhat ruled by your hand strength, which grip you're using, your style, what you like the feel of. Foil fencers tend to like to be very tight into the bell guard more so than epe fencers, but not always. Going back to the rules, in no case on a pistol grip, can your thumb be more than two centimeters away from the bell guard? So we can't have a grip with a really long end on it with a pistol at the end, just not legal. But we wanna get it set in there for maximum mobility and, and being able to hold the blade, not having our hand cramp up. So we're gonna to wanna to cut that blade down or that grip down to the size that's going to be best for us. Now, 
that grip's going to have to go on to a blade. And you can see we have a wired, ready to go foil. And the tang you can see is very long. They come set up with a long tang. And this would be for a French grip. But of course, this being a competition foil, you're probably going to have a pistol grip on this. Now this brings us to setting up a blade. And the two main things that we're gonna talk about here are canting the blade and grip, and also clocking on the grip. Now, this blade has been set up to go onto a pistol grip and for a right-handed person, and the blade is canted. And what do we mean by this? I'm actually gonna grab an apple over here because it's a little bit bigger and easier to see. I have a standard blade and you can see that it's dead straight. You look at this from any angle and it's just straight. And that's how they come. Now you can see this one is set up and you can see that the tang is bent down. And if you look at the tang from the end, you can see it's also bent in, in the direction. So what do we mean by canting in and down? The blade is going to be canted down from the top of the blade where the groove is down towards the floor a certain amount. And it's also going to be canted in towards the center of the fencer. So a blade for a righty would be canted in this way. A blade for a lefty would be canted in this way. And there's a varying degrees of each. There's a fairly standard way that any um, armorer will set up a weapon if he hasn't been given any guidance. It'll generally be bent, bent at about a 45 degree angle. In other words, about five degrees down and five degrees in will be a fairly standard setup. And that suffices for most people. You will find as you fence that you may want to have more cant. You may want to have a little less cant. If you order a blade online and it comes, it often comes with no cant in it at all. What does the cant do? If you set up a cant of the weapon, you have a weapon that when you hold it, relaxed, that they'll wind up being pretty much a straight line from your arm to the tip without you having to do anything funny with your wrist or your hand or hold the blade in a weird way. You'll just have kind of a straight set. And we're human beings and we're all different, but we fall within a fairly narrow range of normal. And for starting people, that sort of in and down, moderate amount of cant is enough. And it usually suffices for the rest of their fencing career. Other people may find that their style, and they may find this through their coach, through uh, working with their coach and through experimentation, may want to have more or less of that. And that is something that you want to work one-on-one -on -one with your coach, your armorer, and helping you set up the blade. But we have a blade here for a foil that has been set up with a down and inward cant. It's a fairly standard amount. And if it's going to go together, it'll go together again with the bell guard and then the socket and then the grip and the grip will go on and you can see without the bell guard it looks you can see how much cant is in and down on this blade looks like a fair amount but it's actually not that bad so the cant helps us with alignment and a certain amount of cant can also make a blade feel a little bit lighter and move the center of gravity of the blade um, a little bit closer to the hand. That can make our blade feel a little quicker uh, and can help us with our point control. The thing to remember with blade setup, particularly things like this, um, having the proper equipment and having it properly set up will help your fencing, but it will not cure an issue. If you are having a problem with taking a blade in six, some cant of a particular type might make that a little bit easier, but it isn't going to fix your six. The only thing that's going to fix your six is working on it with your coach. So, foil rules. Oh, I'm um, clocking. I almost forgot. 
So clocking is the grip and how the grip is in relation to the clock. Is my grip twisted out? Is my grip twisted in? Typically, when a blade is being set up, um, a grip, the clocking, the grip is clocked in a little bit. In other words, the grip is rotated counterclockwise. If you're looking at the weapon for a, uh, if you're looking at your grip and at the weapon for a right-handed person, it's clocked counterclockwise. And for a, right, a left-handed fencer, it's going to be clocked in a little bit clockwise. In other words, your hand is going to be tipped, the grip is going to be tipped in a little bit so that when you're holding in a neutral position, it's going to bring that blade out and line it up and it's going to affect the balance of the blade too where you have a natural close six position without having to fight anything there are some fencers who like a lot more clocking some who like a lot less um, but most people fall into that same range of having it clocked over maybe to 11 somewhere between 10 and 11 o'clock uh, for a, for a righty in between one and two o'clock for a lefty with the grip lined up. There are a few weapon assembly tricks that can get you there very quickly. For those of you really interested in weapon assembly, let me know, maybe we'll do a video that delves into that more deeply. So we have our blade set up with the cant, we have our grip at the right le uh, length and we've got it clocked and our weapon is all assembled properly. What are some foil rules that are specific to the weapon? We know that the weapon can't be longer than a certain amount. That's pretty obvious. And the size of our bell guard is also part of the rules. It can't be too big. So I can't take a epe bell guard and throw it on my foil. That would not be allowed. But you can't really find anything other than a legal um, size bell guard on the market. So we don't have to worry too much about that. If we bought everything from a reputable fencing supply and um, we put our weapon together, we're going to pass tech on that. Uh, we want to make sure we have the right length blade for the age group that we're fencing in. <clears throat> and then we get into the two big things on foils is the amount of bend in the blade and the amount of tape. Now, we're allowed to have some bend in the blade. And generally speaking, you want your blade, particularly in foil, but you want your blade to take a gentle sort of downward bend when you're holding it. You want to see it bending down just a little bit. And that downward bend, though, has a maximum. We can't have it like this, where we have a blade that it's very hard for somebody to parry because we're able to literally fence around corners. Um, but we are allowed to have a, a bend that if you put the blade on a flat surface with the bend, that you could put a block that's two centimeters and it would just barely clear. So we can't have any more than a certain amount of bend. So you'll often find when you're in a bout, the referee will, will tell you, hey, I need you to straighten your blade out a little bit. And it's usually because there's too much bend in it. It might also be because it's got a terrible snake in it like that, and they want you to get it into a more reasonable shape. But you're looking for a slight bend, no more than two centimeters over the entire length of the blade. We also don't want to have any particular sharp kink points in the blade. Um, not only is that not really in the keeping of the rules, but it's also going to make your blade much more likely to break at that point, and break, broken blades are more dangerous. Now, tape. Rules on the tape are basically it's kind of more open than people imagine. People think that there's a rule about the minimum amount of tape on there, but really there's just a general that says the tape should be about 100 millimeters which is about the length of a dollar bill from the tip of your weapon down. And you can see from our tape to our tip, about the length of a dollar bill. And this is a good, safe amount. What the tape does is if you were to hit someone and the blade bent up and the barrel or the top part of the blade hit their lame as well as your tip hitting the lame, it's gonna mess up the scoring and you're not going to get a point. This is why there's not a minimum amount of tape rule on there or why a, a referee often will not, if you know, might not 
give you, say you need to retape a blade because it's only gonna hurt you. If it's not taped properly, it's only going to hurt you. Generally speaking, you don't wanna have a lot more than that 100 millimeters or so of tape because a lot of tape changes the weight of the blade. You don't have that sharp bit of blade to beat with. Um, you get a little thud from the tape instead of a good snap from the blade itself. Um, uh, so you want to keep it in good condition. You want to keep it about 100 millimeters long. Again, if you really want to do a deep dive into foil assembly and taping and stuff like that, we can do that in a later tape, in a later um, later video. So once again, we've got everything all set up for foil. We know the rules can't be too long. Bell guard can't be too big. Generally, don't have to worry about that as long as you've got the right size blade for your age group. You want to set the blade up with an appropriate amount of cant and clocking your grip cut to the right length so that everything's nice and comfortable. When you're going to a competition, you want to try and set all your blades up as close as possible to one another as you can. So that changing from one blade to another doesn't cause you too much angst and it doesn't affect your fencing. Word to the wise. You can take the exact same brain brand of blade that you have hand selected to have the same amount of flexibility to it as your pre, as your other blade. You can set them up with exactly the same grip, cut exactly the same gate, with exactly the same cant, and the same bell guard, and the same amount of tape, and the same color, and you will find that they're all going to feel just a tiny bit different from one another. There's really no way around it. So. How do you deal with that? You deal with that by practicing with all your weapons. Rotate through your stock when you practice. We've talked about this before. That way, when you go into a bout, if you have to switch weapons, you're not freaked out because you're using something that you haven't used before. You also don't want to have like, well, I started off with a French grip and now I've got a pistol and I'm just going to use my French for a backup. Well, you're not going to work out with it or use it at all. It's a tremendously different feel and a different way to hold the blade. And if you suddenly have to go from your favorite pistol grip to a French grip in the middle of a competition, I'll bet that's your last DE of the day. Set up your equipment as close as possible to one another. Rotate through your stock, reduces wear and tear, and gives you control over some more variables. All right, so that's pretty much it for foil. Now, Epe. Epeists love their equipment. We love to talk about our equipment. We love to try our, uh, do all of that sort of stuff. We're all sure that there's a certain magical mix um, that is going to make us the most awesome FA fencer in the world. Um, probably not, but we can certainly set something up to our liking and to our style of fencing. And because we have more flexibility in our rules in terms of where we can hit and score and how, um, we have a little bit more flexibility in how our weapons can be set up uh, to take advantage of different styles of fencing. But at the basics, we have the same set of things that we have. We have the same orthopedic grips in Epe that we would have in foil. We have a lot more varieties of French grips and reasons for using those than foil would. Um, and we have something additional in that our bell guards. Um, if I'm going to hold this over the center of the, the hole in the bell guard, and you can see, hopefully, that the hole in the bell guard is not in the center of the bell guard. So not only can we clock our weapon, uh, our, our grip in and out on the weapon, but we can also change the rotation of where that is. Usually a righty with an orthopedic grip, and that describes probably 75% of the fencers out there, will have it set up so that, this, that most of the bell guard goes to the outside and below their hand, because the grip is gonna be bent down a little bit and in, and this is gonna protect this part of the hand, and also means I have a wider part of the bell guard available for more leverage when I'm taking blades. A left-handed fencer will rotate it around or the other way around. So I'll have it 
more of the grip out here, again, for exactly the same reasons. I'm protecting the outside of my hand, and I'm able to get a little more leverage with this part of the blade because the bell guard becomes a very important part of our blade takes and our opposition reposts. It acts a little bit like a snowplow, and it even has a camel-like shape to it to help us displacing our opponent's blade. So that's why it's not in the middle, is to give us more advantage on either side. Now, this means that if I have a great deal of cant in or down on my weapon, I might have to move where my socket is. So you'll notice that some FAs you'll see set up will have the socket on the inside, but some of them might have them over on the outside. And the only reason for that is because perhaps that fencer with the amount of cant or the size of their fingers or thumb, they can't, there's not room for the plug on this side, but there's more room over here. So they'll move it over to that part of the blade. That's the only reason someone would do that. There's no inherent advantage to one side or the other. Um, it's just what's going to work for you um, in your setup. You may find some people with extreme amounts of cant and clocking on their weapon in a particular style. And if you want to go look up uh, an example of that, you could go look up uh, videos of uh, Paolo Pizzo from Italia, the Italy fencing, and see that extreme amount of cant that he has and that sort of style that he has of using it. Um, if I had to fence with one of his blades, I think mostly what I'd get is a sore arm and probably I'd get hit a lot. But it works for him and he has adapted the weapon to his style rather than adapting himself to the weapon. Just like in foil, we're going to be doing that cant. You can see the two blades, one is straight, one is canted down and in. And you'll find again that you're going to want to work with your coach and maybe, maybe borrow a friend's weapon, try a club weapon with a little more cant to it. Um, while you're home here during your quarantine stage, I recommend not taking your weapon apart and going crazy with it. Unless you're already a fencer who does all of their armory, I don't recommend making a lot of these changes, right? It's really easy to break the wires in the FA when you're doing these things. Like if you suddenly decide, I'm gonna try my socket on the other side and you loosen the pommel nut and you spin the socket over and you tighten everything back down, you just broke your wires. It's not that simple. You have to make sure the wires are cleared and, and get it around where you need it to be. Um, so if you haven't done that before, don't do it now because you're just gonna cause yourself some heartache. That's sort of a get into the armory with a, with a qualified armor and learn how to do it one-on-one -on -one is a better way to do that. So rules surrounding FAs, we already covered one of them when we were talking about foil, that it must be fit through this gauge. In other words, it can't be more than 200 meters, we have no, uh, 20 centimeters or 200 millimeters from the front of the bell guard to the end of the grip. And also you'll notice that there's a depth gauge on this for how deep the guard can be. Now, the reason a weapon might not pass that is because you can see this bell guard is all dented up. So this needs to be taken apart, the dents hammered out, and the bell guard recentered. But you can see on this one, it fits just fine. Now, the other thing that is important on an FA is um, that it has to fit through this gauge. People can put a lot of bend in and down on their weapon. And if they put too much of it down, in and down on their weapon, they will find that it won't fit through this gauge. This one just fits nicely and it's fine. But if you have too much downward bend, particularly for a pommeling fence that likes to have a lot of downward bend, you might find that you've made the blade no longer legal. Um, and you will have to have that cant fixed um, before you can fence with it. They don't check your weapons for this 
on strip, although a referee will kind of have a trained eye and they'll say, hmm, that looks a little suspect. I want to check it out. And the usual way they'll check it out just really quickly is they'll put the blade parallel with the ground and they'll see if the grip is, has some room. They'll roll it around and they'll say, okay, that's, that's probably okay. Now here's a grip for a left-handed fencer, and this is kind of the extreme end of things. This is a left-handed fencer from our club, and you can see that there's a great deal of bend in and down on this weapon. This would not normally be an illegal amount of bend to have in and down because it would go outside of the bell guard. So what this fencer has done is rotated their bell guard around so that it's oriented like a right-handed fencer would use, thus keeping all of this inside the realm of normal and passing the test, barely. And that's for a fencer, again, who fences with an extreme outside left-handed stance around like this. So they have adapted their blade to work better with that type of fencing. Because they're a French grip fencer, they're not taking the blade as much. So they're not as worried about losing bell guard leverage. They're more concerned about covering their hand and getting more bend into the tang of the blade while it remains legal. So other FA rules is the bend downward. They're allowed two millimeters in, um, <clears throat> excuse me, two centimeters, I think, in, um, in foil, but they're only allowed one in FA. So we can't have too much downward bend. And we also don't want that downward bend is not allowed to happen in a really sharp angle. You can see one of the famous old cheats used to be to right before the tip of the blade, have it bend like that. Just boop. We'll bend down here at the end, picking over the top of bell guards and such. Um, yeah, it'll help with tipping over the back of bell guards. It may not help with anything else though. And if you have an opportunity to pick underneath somebody's hand, you might miss it because you have that kind of a bend. So you want your blade generally from straight to a slight downward bend um, for better target practice, better target control. Um, and also because um, it's kinder on the blade if one hits you know, tip sets and it bends up, it's already got a little pre-bend to it and it wants to go in that direction. Um, technique tip, if you find that you keep bending down, it's because you drop in your shoulder or drop in your hand. Rise with the touch. So, I have a blade of the right length because of my age group. I have a blade that's no longer than legally allowed and it is also going to fit inside and it's got the appropriate amount of bend in it. That covers all of the basic things for foil and FA. Now, for you FAs that are interested in French grip fencing, there are a host of ways that this is done and a whole bunch of kinds of French grips. You've got something that's fairly traditional, fairly straight, and people will either hold it in a classic style or they'll hold it at the end of the pommel. You've got some more traditional shapes, but covered and the pommel also covered um, with a golf grip for pommelers. This gives them a better, better grip on the weapon. You even have grips such as, um, such as this one uh, that have a lot of uh, downward bend to them. And they even have a pommel in this case that's pistol gripped this is actually what's called, this is made by Karut, it's called the System Pommel. These are Karma Grips um, uh, made uh, by Fencing Post. Um, there are lots and lots of different shapes of these. And again, the idea is to find something that works for you, for your style and for how you're going to fence with the weapon. Are you going to be all the way back on the pommel? Do you like to try and take the blade? Are you going to be avoiding the blade at all costs? Um, all of those different ways that you can go about setting the blade up so that it is adapted to your style of fencing and your strengths, not that you're adapting to it. Again, just like with the foil, 
once I've decided on my setup, I want to set all my weapons up as closely as possible to one another. Epe fencers can get a little crazy about this, um, but that's okay. What are they really doing? What they're doing is they're trying to remove a variable. They're trying to place some control. Any foil fencer, any epe fencer that spends time getting their equipment the way they like it and keeping it that way is taking away from uh, the problems that beset us at any tournament at least one variable that is no longer there, something that they're not going to have to spend their energy adapting to. Their equipment is their equipment set up for their fencing. This is a transferable skill. You can set things up as much as possible to suit the way that you are. We all need to be adaptable and we all have things uh, thrust upon us that are not necessarily the things that we'd want to have. But there are things that we control. So we look for those things we can control and we concentrate on those things remove those variables and remove those impediments to our success. And sometimes that means we will a lot outside the norm and sometimes that means we don't. But we need to do what we need to do with our equipment to make the equipment help us rather than hold us back. Like I said in the beginning, a weapon setup isn't going to cure a problem but it certainly can make things better than they are. So whether you're a crazy left-handed fencer that fences from extreme angles to a more standard fencer with a more straight ahead style, you can set your weapon up to, to help that make it better and have all of your stuff ready to roll and fine tune it so that it feels good to you and helps you with your fencing. So that's it for today. Um, let me know, uh, uh, come, come to the uh, Coach's Corner on Wednesday nights. Let me know what armory stuff you would like to talk about. Are there a lot of people out there who want to take a real deep dive into how to set up French Group Epe? Are there people out there that want to um, go through the complete setup of a foil, that want to go through taping a foil? How do, what's the easiest way to tape it? How do I set it up that way? Um, what variables are out there? Does somebody want to get into how stiff a blade is, how light a blade is, how flexible a blade is, um, and what the uh, advantages and disadvantages of all those things are? If you want to dive into something like that in particular, let me know and we'll put it on the list for a future armory video. We'll get as detailed as you want and, uh, and help you cure your eels mind. So thanks for tuning into the Northwest Fencing Center, Wednesday's armory division here. Um, I'm going to hold still after I say goodbye, count to three, and then you'll see me walk up to the camera to turn it off. Thanks for tuning in. Come to the Coach's Corner tonight. Let me know what else you'd like to talk about or what questions all of this has given you. Thanks for tuning in.